Okay, we're going to start in a minute here. We're just going to let everyone a um, couple more minutes to let some people into the room. We had some hiccups getting everyone over here. So I don't want to wait up one more minute and then we'll start. Sounds great. Okay, thanks everyone and welcome to our breakout, the 2021 IRC update. Sorry, there were some problems getting over here. Um, we will work to fix that uh, if we do breakouts again next year. We want the process to be a little bit more smooth for everyone. So today you're going to hear from George Williams from West Coast Code Consultants. George is an ICC certified master code professional and certified building official and holds numerous additional certifications through the International Code. Over his nearly 20 year career, he has worked with multiple jurisdictions throughout California, Nevada, Washington, Utah, Wyoming, and North Dakota, and was responsible for the startup of two county building departments in parts of the country where no previous form of building construction regulatory process existed. This includes the adoption of codes, implementation of permitting process, and the development of various policies and procedures. In his role with WC3, George, George serves as a lead inspector for a number of multi-million dollar projects for Utah's Division of Facilities and Construction Management, performs complex commercial plan reviews for client jurisdictions, and oversees the development and direction of WC3's online training program through the WC3 Academy. And George, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Stacy, for that introduction. Appreciate everyone being on today. Here we have, you know, close to 200 people on with us today, and hopefully we can stay entertained and uh, excited here on this Friday afternoon. So we'll be talking today about the changes to the 2021 IRC. So most of you are probably familiar with the 2018 or becoming familiar with the 2018. Um, with the code cycle, obviously, sometimes it takes a few cycles before some of the different changes start to click in our minds and start to, uh, you know, be applied on a regular basis. So there'll be a few things that might be 2018 changes that I'll want to emphasize. But for the most part, we're just going to, on a quick level, in a two-hour time frame, try and go through the most significant changes from the 2021 IRC. So we do have a question pool and I can see questions as they're asked and um, I'll probably need to answer those verbally. So our course objectives are to one, highlight some of the significant changes from the 2021 IRC. Um, obviously, like I said, some of them may have occurred in the 2018 version, but for the most part, they're all 2021 changes. We also want to share how you can learn more about the 2021 IRC changes through other resources, whether it's through ICC or other online resources. Um, with our time constraints today, we're not going to be able to cover all of the changes that happened in the code. So depending on what your background is, if you're very interested in energy code, for example, or electrical code, uh, we may be somewhat limited in what we can cover in this time period, but we will try to cover some of the things that we find are the most um, significant changes. Anyone else having audio is issues? I'm seeing a, an audio question from one of the attendees. All right, we'll proceed. I, yeah, I can hear you fine, George. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. So first thing to know, if you're familiar with the code cycle and how the codes change, the marginal markings become very important. So each time the code changes, anything that has been modified, whether it's just a, a few words or punctuations been modified, or new content that's been added to the code, you'll see a solid black bar in the margins. So as you look through a new code book, 
anything you see with the solid black bar you can tell has been changed from the previous printing. So um, one challenge with that is if you're in a location where you previously used the 2015 code, for example, changes that occurred during the 2018 code will no longer be marked in the margins. So you're only able to see changes that, that occurred one code cycle at a time. So keep that in mind as we go through this content. If you see a solid black arrow, that means that an entire section, an entire paragraph or table has been deleted. So it's, it's not very useful, except when you're scanning through your code book and you know there used to be a section that said X, Y, or Z, and you simply can't find it, sometimes the black arrow will kind of be a, a tip off that maybe that section has since been deleted. Likewise, if you see an asterisk, that means that text, um, any sort of verbiage or a table has been relocated. So maybe you used to find it in section 301, you've read through the entire section and you can't find what you're looking for. Then you see the little asterisks in the margin and you know, oh, it's been relocated somewhere else. So that's great for knowing that it's relocated. However, it doesn't necessarily tell you where it's been relocated. Now, when you see the double asterisks, that's indicating that whatever you're looking at has been relocated from somewhere else in the code and now it has found a new home. So understanding these marginal markings really is helpful as you advance to a new code and a new code is adopted. So hopefully that's useful to you as you explore your new code book. Lastly, italicized terms. So as we read through the code, anywhere in the code where we see italicized terms, we're gonna know that those are terms that are defined in the code itself, generally in chapter two. So terms that have a specific meaning to the ICC who's producing the code book, they have a definition within the code and that's what that word means in a code context. Now words that do not appear in italicized lettering, those terms you're gonna just use the generally accepted definitions. So if you look at this section here on the screen, 301.1.4, the only italicized terms are the International Building Code, um, but you can see the rest of the terms in that section are in standard font. So we would just go with generally accepted definitions of those words. So for example, we've got structures, we've got containers, we've got buildings and things like that. All right, next would be a lot of you may not currently have a copy of the 2021 IRC. And as code adoptions take place, depending on you know, what company you work for, or if you work for a jurisdiction or a architectural firm, you may not have access to these codes right away or the day in which they're adopted. So having access online is important. And the easiest ways to access the new code or first option would just be go to any internet search bar and put in 2021 IRC public access version. Now, if you want to get more technical, option two would be just cut and paste this URL into your browser, and you can pull that up in the public <clears throat> access version. So the public access version, um, it's available online. It's a little bit clunky if you're going to be using it for your day-to-day -day work. Um, the search feature isn't ideal. But for the most part, it allows you to access the information and it does provide some hyperlinks that can kind of navigate you through the code. So feel free to check out the public access version and see how that's going. Now, other resources that may be um, valuable to you. If you're very familiar with the 2018 code, um, and now you're moving to the 2021 version, you can buy what's called a red line edition. And the red line edition that ICC produces will have previous um, verbiage stricken out and it will have new content in a different color. You would think it would be red, but it's generally blue. But anyway, so feel free to think about those different resources. 
And ICC also produces significant changes books that you can buy, and they'll simply outline the significant changes and provide you some context on why those particular changes may have been made. All right, so we're going to jump right into the administration aspect of the 2021 IRC. So the first thing that changed is section 102.7.1 changed a little bit regarding additions, alterations, or repairs. So there wasn't any real clear language in the IRC about when you would or would not jump over to the international existing building code. So this change clarifies that. So it says that where alteration causes the use or occupancy to be changed to one that's not within the scope of this code, meaning the IRC, then the provisions of the international existing building code shall apply. So when that would occur would be, say you have a single family home and you know your town is growing, your city's growing and areas that were residential are now becoming commercial. And say you're gonna take a single family home and turn it into an insurance office or a dental office or something like that. So now you're changing occupancy from an IRC related building to a B occupancy or some other occupancy. Now the provisions of the IEBC would take effect. Other than that, there's no scenario when single family homes are being remodeled or being altered in any way where the provisions of the international existing building code would apply. So that's just clarification there in 102.7.1. All right, that's it for the administration chapter. Sometimes people are surprised with how few changes actually take place from one code cycle to the next. Um, we could do this class for an eight hour period and we, we wouldn't run out of changes. It's just that some of the changes are, are very minor in nature. And for the most part, the changes that do occur um, when you really look at the overall scope of the code um, are not necessarily earth shattering. Um, we will have one slide at the very end of the presentation where we'll just have a summary of these significant changes, which is simply what you are provided by ICC. All right, let's move on to chapter two, definitions. So just to review, all terms defined in chapter two are going to show up in italicized text throughout the code. So the first thing that was changed is emergency escape and rescue openings. So that was added and it says an operable exterior window, door, or other similar device. So I think for a long time, we always thought of emergency escape and rescue windows, but the truth is it can be other types of devices. It could be some sort of a hatch. Um, it could be a door. It could be some sort of a, a port of some kind. So the definition has, has changed on that one. Next one would be grade floor emergency escape and rescue openings. So previously this definition again referenced a window and now the code has changed and it says an emergency escape and rescue opening located such that the bottom of the clear opening is not more than 44 inches above the finished grade. So again, previously it talked about the window sill. Um, now that it's not necessarily going to be a window, and even if it is a window, we're now measuring to the bottom of the clear opening. So previously, so for example, if you had a vinyl window that was a horizontal slider, your window sill might be a good inch and a half lower than the actual clear opening of the window. So that's changed a little bit from previous versions of the code. The next definitions that changed are regarding townhouses. So this is a, a, a good change in the sense that it clarifies terminology that may not have been being used universally from one location to another or from one jurisdiction to another. So the first thing that changed is the definition of a building. So again, if we just uh, did not define building in chapter two, we'd go after a general dictionary definition and that would not be specific enough for the use in the IRC. So the definition of a building is any one or two family dwelling or townhouse or portion thereof used or intended for human habitation, for living, sleeping, cooking, or eating, or any combination thereof. 
And then the key here is that it says, or any accessory structure. So building, as far as the IRC concern is concerned, is limited to one and two family dwellings, townhouse, or a portion thereof, as well as accessory structures. All right, previously it included the word townhouses, plural. So that is changed because the definition of a townhouse has also changed. So a townhouse is a building that contains three or more attached townhouse units. So this may seem like common sense to a lot of you, um, but it was not common sense enough that it wasn't causing problems. So townhouse is a building. It's a building that contains three or more townhouse units. And then townhouse unit previously wasn't defined in the code and it's been added and it is a single family dwelling unit in a townhouse. So in a townhouse building that extends from foundation to roof and that has a yard or a public way on not less than two sides. So again, townhouses extend from foundation to roof and they would not be stacked one on top of another. So that's a good uh, distinction there. All right, that's it for definitions as well. We're going to move on to chapter three, which is our building and planning section of the code. So a new section was added, which is section 301.1.4, and it covers intermodal shipping containers. So here's a picture that I took on an inspection. We had a shipping container hotel that was being erected. And this was the facility in which they were manufacturing the individual shipping container units. So this is what the code's talking about. Now, depending on where your jurisdiction is, you may or may not have seen shipping containers being utilized as buildings. So again, we have the definition of building, which is a one or two family dwelling or a townhouse or an accessory structure. So if we're putting a shipping container on a residential lot and using it as a storage shed, now that shipping container is becoming a building by definition, and now the provisions of 301.1.4 would apply. So this section is telling you that these shipping containers and buildings constructed out of shipping containers shall be designed in accordance with the structural provisions in section 3115 of the IBC. So we're kind of moving out of the scope of the IRC. We're using a method of construction that is not um, available to be prescriptively driven by the code. And we're going to be required to follow the provisions of the IBC, which are going to be more appropriate for this particular type of construction. So the code would allow you to build a single family home or a townhouse. I haven't seen that attempted yet, but I can imagine it will happen sooner or later. Um, but more frequently, they're being used just as a, a shed or maybe an ADU behind an existing home. So that's a new section that previously did not exist. All right, then we get into 301.2.1.1. And looking at the table in the code in figure 301.2.1.1, it's unlikely that this section applies through much of Nevada just based on your wind design um, criteria. But basically what this section is changed to say is that where the ultimate design wind speed equals or exceeds 140 miles per hour, then you can no longer design prescriptively out of the provisions of the IRC. So if you're in a coastal region, specifically maybe in the, the southwest or near Florida, you're going to have areas where pulling values out of tables for span charts and things like that are no longer valid simply because the wind is has a potential of exceeding this 140 mile per hour range. So in that scenario, then you would be required to have an engineered design, structural engineering stamped according to your state of requirements based on your licensing division. Also, they made some slight changes to the irregular building criteria. So 301.2.2.6, so we now include hillside light frame construction. So when we're building on a steep hillside, 
And the code defines that in item number eight as a slope of one unit vertical and five units horizontal averaged. Then we no longer comply with the regular building provisions of the IRC. And again, we would be back to an engineered design. So that applies to slopes that are one unit vertical over five units horizontal. If your tallest cripple wall exceeds seven feet, or if less than 50% of the total area below the lowest frame floor is living space. And there were no changes to items one through seven. So again, our irregular building provisions have simply been expanded. Seismic anchorage of water heaters has also been expanded. So section 301.2.2.10 tells us that water heaters and thermal storage units in townhouses that are in seismic design category C must be anchored. So previously, the code simply addressed seismic design categories D0, D1, and D2. And now if you're a townhouse and in seismic design category C, then you're also included in those requirements for seismic bracing of the water heater or a storage tank. So again, if you're a single family home in seismic design category C, nothing has changed. But if you're a townhouse or inside of a townhouse unit, uh, then seismic bracing would be required. All right, the separation of townhouses, again, since we redefine terms in the code, we had to modify some of the code language itself to then utilize those newly defined terms. So individual townhouses and townhouse units have been added in. They also made some changes where the code previously said fire sprinkler system. Now it's going to read automatic sprinkler system. And then some other changes occurred regarding common walls. So common walls separating townhouses, they're permitted to terminate at the inside of the exterior wall where the prescribed fire blocking is provided. So generally with townhouse construction, um, more often than not, some sort of a shaft liner system is used to create our separation between units. And that shaft liner would extend all the way through the exterior wall framing uh, to the inside face of the exterior sheathing. Now the codes come along and said, okay, well, we're going to allow that to stop at the inside face of the exterior wall. So not extending through the stud cavity itself. However, two binominal blocking needs to fill that entire stud cavity at that intersection. So that's a, a slight change more on the means of construction, but it may also um, allow you to change some of your details regarding your um, shaft liner systems. Now, one thing to be aware of is you still need to follow your shaft liner um, manufacturer's installation instructions. So they've done different testing and they've done listing of uh, their products. And the code language itself does not change the testing that's already taken place or change the provisions of the listing of their materials themselves. All right, another change regarding our separation walls between townhouse units um, is in relation to their structural independence. So section 302.2.6, talks about how we need structural independence. And the whole concept there was that one townhouse unit could burn to the ground without pulling down this separation wall between units. So that has now been altered with the addition of exception number six, townhouse units that are protected by a fire sprinkler system, as long as it complies with section 2904 or NFPA 13D, um, would now eliminate the need for that full structural independence. So the concept there is if we have two townhouse units that are each fully fire sprinkled, um, there should not be a, a fire of significant size to continue burning long enough that you're going to be pulling down the adjacent unit. At least that's the theory behind it. All right, the next comment is, or the next item here is kind of interesting. If you have two family dwellings, so duplexes, depending on where the property lines are, um, there's been some misinterpretation of what the code was requiring. And because of that misinterpretation, the code has 
provided some clarifying language. So if you have a two family dwelling, it needs to be separated from each other by a wall or a floor assembly that's not less than one hour fire resistance rating. Now, the clarifying language here is that that separation shall be provided regardless of whether a lot line exists between the two dwelling units or not. So what was happening was the code requires that one hour wall, but when there was a property line between the two units, a lot of people were saying, well, I've got a wall that has a zero lot line separation from a property line, so it needs to be one hour rated. And then I've got the other unit that also has zero fire separation distance from the property line, so it needs to be one hour rated. And you were ending up with two one hour walls between the two family dwellings. And the code's basically saying one one hour wall is sufficient. And the truth of the matter is that the fire doesn't know or care if there's a property line between the units or not. So I think that's a pretty important distinction in the code there. Now remember, this also applies in the horizontal direction. So with a two family dwelling, you could stack one unit on top of another, where if we're dealing with townhouse units, they can never be stacked vertically, one on top of the other. All right, the next change was that the penetrations through the wall separating townhouse units, they added a provision in here for water-filled sprinkler piping. So if you're dealing with a 13R or 13D system, you're Sprinkler piping material is generally going to be a CPVC plastic. Previously, the code didn't really allow for that penetration to occur. And now the code has changed to include water filled sprinkler piping um, as an acceptable method. Now, if you had a dry sprinkler system, um, then you would not have a water filled pipe in that location, and the CPVC plastic would not be allowed. So again, one thing to be aware of is to check with your shaft liner manufacturer um, to see what penetrations they allow. So again, they've tested their material. Um, some manufacturers are more stringent than others. So the code will allow for a penetration. If you provide an acceptable penetration of a metal pipe or a water-filled fire sprinkler pipe, then as long as you fill the annular space around the pipe, with a approved material, generally a fire caulking material, uh, then those penetrations would be allowed. Again, a few small word changes to our garage door or our dwelling to garage door opening um, requirements. In 302.5.1, the code now reads, door shall be self-latching and equipped with a self-closing or an automatic closing device. So previously, the code required that the door be self-closing, but there was no specific requirement in there that it also be self-latching. So in theory, you could have had a door, you know, similar to a, a restaurant door or something where it closes, but there's not actually any mechanical device latching it shut. So some of the logic there is that, you know, the door will close, but if the pressures are right or the heat is right in a, a fire type situation, you could, in theory, have that door opening. Now, if the door is self latching, then we could be we could rest assured that that door is going to stay closed in the closed position. All right. Next comes the mechanical ventilation changes. So a local exhaust system is an acceptable substitute for natural ventilation in a kitchen. Now that's allowed if the exhaust from that kitchen is either 100 CFM intermittent on a switch of some kind or running at 25 CFM continuous. So this is just making kitchens a little bit easier to deal with. You could place them in the center of a single family home. You wouldn't necessarily have to have an operable window or openings into adjacent room or things like that. All right, the next change allows for slightly reduced ceiling heights in habitable spaces. So the minimum ceiling height can be reduced to six foot six inches under beams if they're spaced at least 36 inches apart. So we've got this picture here from an old pioneer structure. 
And I don't think those are quite 36 inches apart, but I think it gives a good visual of what this requirement is. So rather than a seven foot ceiling height or six foot eight underneath a beam as previously spelled out in the code, now if we space these beams at 36 inches apart or greater, now we can reduce that headroom down to six foot six inches. So minor change, but there are applications where maybe that two inches is a lifesaver. Another change, again, sometimes the terminology in the code is just not very clear, or it can be easily misunderstood or misinterpreted. Interpreted. So here's a change in section 308.4.5. So previously where we had um, safety glazing, there was a word in that section that talked about windows that are facing either a tub or a shower enclosure. And then the question came up of what exactly does that mean? So you've got a tub, the tub doesn't really have a head or a face. And the question was, well, how do I know what windows are facing the wet surface or the shower or the tub? So to fix that problem, they just swapped out the word facing with the word adjacent. So now you can see in the picture here, we've got a freestanding tub with a window directly adjacent to the tub. And there's no question on whether that window is facing the tub or not facing the tub, et cetera. So another exception was modified. Glazing that is more than 60 inches measured horizontally from the water's edge of a bathtub, hot tub, spool, or whirlpool, spa, et cetera, um, needs to be safety glazing. So previously, it also included that verbiage and in a straight line. So in a wet scenario, if we've got water being splashed out of this tub, um, it's going to go in different directions. Uh, depending on the slope of the floor, it could flow in different directions. And it's kind of inconsequential whether that measurement's taking in a straight line or whether it's taking kind of in a, a curved line or in a line that has a little elbow in it. So now that that's a little bit more clear, a little bit easier to deal with. It's just 60 inches horizontally in any direction. All right, so next we deal with skylights. Now, some of these code sections are sections you may deal with on a a regular basis, and some of them are more obscure topics that maybe um, come up on occasion, but do not come up on every single single family dwelling that you're dealing with. So this is one of those more obscure sections that maybe you've never read before, but we'll talk about the changes either way. So section 308.6, they replaced the word retaining screen with broken glass retention screen. So the purpose of this screen is not necessarily to retain the window or the window assembly, but it's to retain the broken glass of the skylight um, in the event that it gets broken. So recently I was supposed to go to the um, mountain zoo outside of Denver and just about two or three days before I got there, they had an incredible hailstorm. And there's videos online of the skylights inside of that mountain zoo just being shattered by these baseball size hailstones. So that's one scenario where this section would, would assist in ensuring that the people inside the building are not being rained down on with broken glass in the event that a skylight breaks. So this section clarified that screens will be with, one, they need to cover the full area of the glass. They also need to be within four inches of the glass. So if the screens are considerably lower than the glass itself, then depending on what material the screens are, are made out of, the glass can kind of pick up some steam, pick up some speed as it falls, and it may either shatter upon impact into even smaller pieces, or it could potentially cut through the screen material itself. So section 308.6.5, Again, they just changed that word retaining, retaining to broken glass retention screen. Again, it talks about covering the full area of the glass. And then it, again, still has to meet condition one or condition two. All right. Again, we've got a question answer ability here. 
So if anyone has a question and wants to type it in, I can easily glance over there and see what the question is. All right, we're going to continue on on our emergency escape and rescue opening provisions. So once we escape from a bedroom or a basement or the second story of a building or an enclosed attic as required by the code, we need to ensure that there is then a path from that location back to a public area. So in most residential applications, we're considering the street in front of the house as a public area, or you could have an alleyway behind the house as a public area. The intent is that as first responders arrive, whether they be police or paramedics or firefighters, that you be able to access wherever they are. So on rare occasion, I've seen a house where they happen to have a, a central courtyard. Um, think of kind of an old Spanish villa of some kind. They have a central courtyard and they have bedrooms and the bedroom opens up a window into the central courtyard. Um, so in an emergency, if you were to exit out that emergency escape and rescue opening, you'd then be trapped in the center of this building um, in the event of a fire or anything else. Other times we have buildings built with a close proximity to adjacent lots, and you may be able to escape out of the, the home itself, but then you can't go anywhere because everything else is blocked off. So the code has required a minimum width of 36 inches and that's just a horizontal width, 36 inches wide. Now, other changes that occurred are the operational constraints of window control devices. So any emergency escape and rescue opening has to be operable from the inside without the use of keys, without the use of any sort of a special tool like a Allen wrench or a screwdriver or anything like that and without any sort of special knowledge. So a lot of times there's some interesting window control devices. And if you don't have some sort of explanation of how they work, um, you're gonna have very little chance of escaping the building. So we did get a question here. We've got two questions actually. The first one is, can we, you please coordinate? Uh, so somebody's having issues with our audio not matching up with our screen. And that sounds like maybe an internet related issue. Um, I don't have a lot of animation or anything at all. So it seems like it's been working out pretty well. We did get a question from Roger that asked if the backyard area can be used as that public area. Um, I think the intent is that somewhere on the property, there be a 36 inch wide path that leads back to generally the, the public street. So that might be interpreted different ways in different jurisdictions. Um, but same thing, if you have an emergency escape and rescue opening, um, if it's on the second floor, for example, someone may be waiting there to be rescued by a, a first responder. And if they can't get into the backyard either, then any sort of rescue from that opening is going to be unlikely. So I think the intent of the code is to have those openings 36 inches wide. Um, you could still fence off the backyard, but you would need a gate or something to pass through there. All right, so jumping back to our operational constraints, they added language and a reference standard to ASTM F2090. Um, so that would be a standard that makes sure that these opening devices are going to actually work in the event of an emergency and are going to be intuitive on how they operate. The last thing that they added is the device itself cannot be more than 70 inches above the finished floor. So if you remember, the window opening itself can't be more than 44 inches above finished grade. Previously, the code talked about window sill. Now we're measuring to the opening itself. Um, the problem is a lot of times we want to put the control device higher than 44 inches off the floor um, with the interest of fall protection. So I've got little boys at home and they can get mischievous. So you can put your control device higher than the 44 inches, um, but it should never be more than 70 inches above the finished floor. Now the challenge has been um, 
how would a small person or small child utilize that opening in the event of an emergency if they can't reach up to the 70 inches? So that's a question that um, can still be posed to the code making bodies, but you've got to draw the line somewhere. So 70 inches, at least it's within range. Whereas if it were 90 inches, then it would probably be a more prevalent problem. So those are some of the changes to these emergency escape openings. All right, another question from Roger. He says, uh, the path may go next to a fire, then what? So in the commercial building code, we have what we call an egress court. And the egress court is required to um, have protection on that side of the building if it's narrower than 10 feet wide. But in a residential application, we don't have egress courts and we wouldn't have any provisions there. Um, so you could technically have your 36 inch wide path immediately adjacent to the home. And if the home were on fire, then you would still have a bad situation on your hand. So one of those things where the code is addressing um, a lot of situations and more standard construction scenarios, but not necessarily every potential scenario. So good, good question, Roger. Thanks for keeping this lively. I'm, I'm sure you don't want to just hear me talk with my own thoughts this entire two hours. So I appreciate the question. All right, continuing on, we've got section 310.2.1. So we, we've, you've probably been familiar with this. This hasn't changed. The minimum opening size is our 5.7 square feet. There's an exception in there for grade floor openings where we're allowed to reduce that to five square feet. And then what changed is in section 310.2.2. .2. So the minimum net clear opening height dimension shall be 24 inches. The minimum net clear opening width dimension shall be 20 inches and the net clear opening dimension shall be the from the result of normal operation. So a lot of times with casement windows, for example, normal operation may only open up to, say, 19 inches wide. And then if you fiddle with the um, opening device, you could unlatch it from, from the hardware, and then you could push it that you know, additional 90 degrees and your opening would then become 20 inches wide. So the code is basically acknowledging that that might have been the case in the past, but the window manufacturers need to create an egress window that opens to the required width without tinkering with the hardware or breaking, you know, there may be a breakaway feature to it. They need to be the result of normal operation. All right, we've got a question from Marshall Cowan. So you say that the bottom of the window has to be 40 inches. So, uh, and okay, so we talked about the bottom of the emergency escape opening, whether it's a window or a door or an access hatch of some kind, that needs to be 44 inches maximum from the finished floor on the interior side of the window. So yeah, we wouldn't be measuring to grade necessarily, we would be measuring to the finished floor surface on the inside of the house. So sorry about that, uh, that flub up of language there. So words are important. So thanks for catching that. All right, again, we renamed section 310.2.3. It used to say window sill height. Now it just says maximum height from floor. So we're acknowledging that they will not always be windows. They may be other type of openings. And rather than measuring to our window seal, we're measuring to the opening itself. Section 310.2.4 was renamed. So now it's emergency escape and rescue openings under decks, porches, and cantilevers. So the problem is with basements, a lot of times our emergency escape and rescue opening, it could be underneath a deck, it could be underneath a porch, but more likely it's going to be underneath a bay window, or maybe you just have a short cantilever where the second floor cantilevers out another two feet above the foundation line. So they've just clarified that the requirements there apply regardless of what the overhang is, whether it's a deck, a porch, or a cantilever. 
Okay, another term that was changed was we used to talk about bulkhead enclosures. And I remember when I first started into this industry, being very confused by the term bulkhead enclosure. So here's a picture of what the code was talking about when it talked about bulkhead enclosures. And now we're going to redefine those as area wells. So again, a window well in truth is an area well. Um, a lot of times you build out your window wells, you could build them with some sort of rock retention. I've seen them built out of tiered lumber. I've seen them built out of, you know, concrete, CMU block, you name it. All of those are area wells. So it's just been expanded to include more than just a traditional bulkhead that you may be familiar with. Requirements for the bulkhead enclosure is you've got to be able to get out of there. So you may have a stairway as shown in the picture here, or you may have some other method of escape like a ladder. If you are using a ladder, then it has to be 12 inches wide, it has to project at least three inches or more, and your maximum spacing between the rungs is limited to 18 inches. So you may have seen these new fiberglass window well enclosures or area well enclosures, and in the side of the fiberglass itself, they'll have steps built in. And that's intended to be a method of escaping from that space. So that would still be allowed. It would need to be 12 inches wide each step. Each step needs to project three inches or more. Um, I think you'd have to use your own interpretation as far as if it's recessed three inches or more, if that meets the intent of the code. And then the spacing between the steps or the rungs, again, would be 18 inches on center. Now, section 310.3 and 310.4 were also revised. Um, there was a lot of changing of paragraphs and reorganization and uh, changing of the section numbers. The ones that were removed was 310.3.1 and 310.3.2. So we've got those different sections that were removed. And then they added new sections. So instead of being a subsection to section 310.3, they now have their own sections there for area wells, ladders, and steps. Now, there's also some changes for emergency escape and rescue openings in existing buildings. So section 310.5, you used to look in 310.2.5, now you jump all the way to 310.5. Replacement windows for emergency escape and rescue openings, again, rather than windows, they updated the references. 310.6 talks about additions. There's an added exception. Exception number three for an operable window complying with section 310.7.1 shall be acceptable as an emergency escape and rescue opening. So then we jump down to three, section 310.1, which is for alterations or repairs of existing basements. So they kind of revised the phrasing a little bit, and then they added that section 310.7.1. So the intent there is that if you have an existing basement, if you have an opening, then it can be utilized. <clears throat> if you add sleeping rooms or bedrooms to an existing basement, then they need to have openings. And there's some other changes in there as well. Okay, we're going to now move on to stairways. So section 311.7 talks about our stairways. So stairways that are not required to comply with the traditional stair provisions as far as rise and run and the everything else are covered in this 311.7. One application would be stairs that are not within or attached to a building, a porch, or a deck. So say you have a very large piece of property, you have 20 acres, you build your house in one quarter of the acre, and then you have a pathway that leads down to a lower section of the property. Along that pathway, if you construct a set of stairs, it does not have to comply with section 311.7 because it would not be attached to a building, would not be attached to your porch or to a deck. So that's one application where stairs could be built on a residential lot and not have to comply with the provisions of the IRC. So I know that is misinterpreted at, at times. 
and you know you have a, a deck out in the middle of nowhere in the back of your property um if you have a deck then you've got to have stairs that comply if you have just landscaping stairs that take you from your upper lawn down to your lower lawn now they no longer need to comply so landscaping stairs probably are a driving factor in this Have you ever seen stairs built out of you know sandstone blocks or or stones or things like that there's really no way to get that consistency and the three eighths maximum difference in your rise and your run and everything else so if that's the case then they do not need to comply other places would be if they lead to a non-habitable attic so a pull down stairs for example it's not a habitable space up there the stair that leads there it could be pulled down as shown in the picture here or you could actually build some other sort of stair, maybe like a um, ship's ladder type of a stair. And as long as it's not accessing habitable space, then it's no longer required to comply with 311.7. And the same would apply to stairs down into a crawl space. Another change that happened, and if, you, if you've been keeping up on changes to the code, um, you might notice that the 2018 code changed and then the 2021 changed as well. So just to re refresh your memory of the 2018 change, a flight of stairs shall not have a vertical rise larger than 151 inches. So eight, 10, 12 years ago, we were at 144 inches. And then in 2015, we added three inches and got up to 147. 2018, we added four more inches and now we're at 151 inches. And that is a product of just our, our design has changed for single family homes. Um, 10 foot ceilings are more appealing than they may have been in the past. Um, you have a 10 foot ceiling and a 24 inch floor joist, and then you start adding flooring and everything else and you may exceed that 144. So just be aware that that changed in the last code cycle to 151 inches. All right, we've got another question regarding our stairway. And regarding the exception to a non-habitable attic and the question is would this be the same for a bedroom loft area so a bedroom loft area would qualify as a habitable space so it would have to comply with section 311.7 um, if you had a loft area that was considered non-habitable and again you can flip back to chapter two and you can read the the definitions of a habitable space um, but generally accessible spaces within your building, within your residential home uh, for living, sleeping, eating, et cetera, are all going to be considered habitable spaces. So um, a bedroom loft area would require code compliant stairs. Now, I guess your question might actually be um, a like a little mezzanine within a bedroom. So a lot of times you have a little mezzanine like a little reading nook that's almost like a built-in bunk bed platform and then you ask yourself how you're going to access that so i believe that was actually also addressed and we may have a slide coming up that addresses that and if not um, then i'll make sure to get back to you i'll have the the attendee list and i'll get you some information on that so great question roger okay let's keep moving on here we've got a lot of slides to cover and we're already an hour in, so I better pick up the pace a little bit. Stairway walking surface, minor grammatical change. The code used to talk about um, inches where it should have been referencing units. Um, that's our intent. We've got an international code. They're not using inches in certain parts of the world. Um, they want to use the term units, so that's just a minor change. There was also an exception that I think is significant. Where the surface of a stair landing is required elsewhere in the code to drain surface water, then the walking surface of the landing shall be sloped not steeper than one unit vertical and 20 units horizontal. So that's a change that's allowing you for a 5% slope on your stair landing, where previously you were limited to a 2% slope. All right, <clears throat> they also added exceptions to 311.7. So we already went over this once. Here's just an example of kind of a non-compliant stair for 
But if that were going up to a non-habitable attic, this is actually going up to a second level in a, in a cabin. Um, but anyway, that's an example of when that might be applicable. Or if you take this stair in reverse and have this going down into a crawl space, for example, then a stair such as that would be acceptable. All right, we talked about stairs that are not attached to a building porch or deck. The same provisions would apply to ramps. So if you have multiple acres and you wanna build a giant concrete ramp that goes down to a pond or something like that, you're not required to have handrails and limit your slopes and everything else you could do. Essentially, whatever you like. Um, I included this picture of a half pipe ramp just as a joke, really. So if you're building a half pipe in your backyard for your skateboarding son, uh, know that ramp does not need to comply with section 311.8. Okay, we talked about this earlier when we talked about emergency escape and rescue openings. Now we're referring to window fall protection. So we're into 312, section 312.2.1. Again, it used to reference window sill. Now we're just going to reference the window opening itself. Um, they removed exception three, and that was because exception three essentially is the language that you find in section 312.2.2. So pretty insignificant change there. Um, we're just changing the words from window seal to window opening. And as we measure these openings, we're measuring to the, from for window fall protection, we do measure to the grade on the outside of the window to see if the window fall protection is required based on the 72 inches. For the emergency escape and rescue opening, we measure to the window opening from the inside, and that measurement's 44 inches maximum. Smoke alarms, so requirement number four was just grammatically fixed, so that does occur on occasion. Requirement number five was added. So in the hallways and in a room open to the hallway, in a dwelling unit where the ceiling height of a room open to a hallway serving bedrooms exceeds that of the hallway by 24 inches or more, then you need to provide a smoke alarm in that location as well. So imagine a, a, a single family home, you've got a great room with a vaulted ceiling and your ceiling's 28 feet high. Then adjacent to that great room, you have a hallway and the hallway is back down to maybe a nine foot ceiling. Now, if I put my smoke alarm in the vaulted ceiling area, it's immediately outside the bedrooms, um, then you're going to collect, it's going to, if that would be the place to put it because you're going to collect smoke at a much sooner level. If your kitchen's on fire, all the smoke is going up into that vaulted ceiling, and that's where you'd want that smoke detector located. Now, if you put the smoke detector at the nine foot ceiling in the hallway, You've got to have all of that smoke accumulate and keep dropping until it's ever going to get to that detector. So that's just a provision in the code. I believe that was already in NFPA 72, um, but now it's codified in the IRC. All right, next requirement number four was added to section 314.3.1, and that's telling us that smoke alarms that are listed and marked as helps reduce cooking nuisance alarms, they can be installed within six, not less than six feet horizontally from cooking appliances. So generally you're gonna be far away from these cooking appliances because you don't want those nuisance trips, but now they've come out with new technology. So the code adapts to the new technology and these devices can be placed within six feet of the cooking appliance. Not within, but not less than, sorry. Okay, carbon monoxide detectors. So this is a change in the 2018. Again, maybe you missed this in the last code cycle, so I just wanted to remind everyone. So carbon monoxide detectors have to be added to existing residential buildings whenever work requiring a permit occurs. So that's pretty, that's pretty expansive. So you, you know, you have a single family home, I decide to remodel a basement bathroom. That's work that requires a permit. Now I need to provide carbon monoxide detectors in the home. 
So that was the change in the 2018. Then they added an interconnectivity requirement, 315.5, that now allows for wireless alarms. So again, you still have to have your primary power and a battery backup, but now they can communicate with one another wirelessly where before they had to be hardwired together. Now, interconnection is not required where removal of wall or ceiling finishes does not occur. So if you can access an attic and you can install these CO detectors and hardwire them together, et cetera, um, then you're going to install them. Otherwise, it's not going to require you to remove wall and ceiling finishes to accomplish that. In 315.2.2 for alterations, they added an exception, and that says insulation alteration or repairs of a mechanical system that are not fuel fired. So if I have an electric uh, wall heater and I need to replace it, then it's work that requires a permit, so the carbon monoxide detectors would then be required. However, if it's not a fuel fired appliance and there's no fuel fired appliances, then obviously that it's kind of a silly requirement. So that's what exception three is covering. All right, now we'll get into accessibility. This might be more interesting. I believe we have a lot of architects on the call here. So this might be more something you're a little more interested in than other things. So first we added some definitions. First one was live work unit. So live work unit was a term that was in the IBC. This might be something you're familiar with. It's a dwelling unit or a sleeping unit in which a significant portion of the space includes a non-residential use that is operated by the tenant. So what this would be is, you know, say you're in San Francisco, you've got a two-story townhouse, and on the ground floor, you run a small deli, and then your family lives upstairs on the second level. That would be a live-work unit. Now, if somebody else rents the upstairs and you operate the business below, that's no longer a live work unit. That's simply an apartment on top of a deli. So it's important that you understand what that definition is. Next is a sleeping unit. So again, this is a term we should be familiar with if you've used the IBC before, but it wasn't in the IRC before. So it's a single unit that provides rooms or spaces for one or more persons it has to include permanent provisions for sleeping, and it can include provisions for living, eating, and either sanitation or kitchen facilities, but not both. So you can have a sleeping unit that has a bedroom, a living room, and a bathroom. Once you add a kitchen, it's no longer a sleeping unit. It turns into a dwelling unit. All right, so these rooms and spaces that are also part of a dwelling unit are not sleeping units. So you can't create separate sleeping units inside of a, an existing dwelling unit. So why does any of that apply? So section 320, 320.1 tells us when we need to deal with accessibility in an IRC um, driven building. So chapter 11 of the IBC applies when there's four or more dwelling or sleeping units in a single structure. So where would that occur? If we have a townhouse, again, a townhouse is a building, and I have five units, for example. Now the provisions of chapter 11 have to apply. Now you might be asking if that is real, because that doesn't sound familiar to you. <laughs> And there is some exemptions in the IBC that exempt um, single level building or exempt multi-level buildings that do not have elevators. So if you're building townhomes and they all have an elevator, then section 320.1 applies and the provisions of chapter 11 of the IBC come into effect. If you have townhome units without elevators, now the provisions of the IBC do not apply. Now, the one place where you can get tripped up on this is if you have single level IRC buildings built as townhomes. So it doesn't occur may, a lot. It may occur in like a, um, in a 55 and older community, for example. So you build townhomes, they're all single level. 
Now the provisions of 320.1 and chapter 11 apply um, as long as there's four or more units in a single building. So that's an interesting requirement there. Now we remove section 320.1.1 for guest rooms and the exception. Then we added 320.2, which is the live work units section. So in live work units, so again, we've got the deli below the single family home above. We've got the um, two-story deli like we talked about. It's a live work unit. The non-residential portion shall be accessible in accordance with section 508.5.9 and 508.5.11 of the IBC. So we're going to build the building to the provisions of the IRC, and then we're going to apply the accessibility provisions of the IBC to the non-residential portion. So again, previously, previous editions of the IRC, some of that got a little bit fuzzy. Now it's been clarified. All right, next move, on, let's move on to solar provisions. So 324.3 talks about photovoltaic systems, so PV systems. First, they added the provision, they always have to be installed per NFPA 70. So you go to the electrical code and that applies to PV systems, whether they're on a commercial building or a residential building. Then section 324.3 also talked about equipment listings. The panels need to be listed per 1703 um, or these other 161703-1 or dash two. The mounting systems themselves need to be listed and labeled per UL 2703. And they added that they need to be installed in accordance with the manufacturer's installation instructions and their listings. So a little bit of guidance on solar. Um, we have a, three solar experts in my office, so I don't necessarily have to dive into it too often. Um, we also have some more solar materials available online. So section 324.6 talks about our roof access and it uses this term BIPV. So that may be a new term to you as well. It's building integrated photovoltaics. So it could be a roof panel. Um, I like to think of it just in my mind as the solar shingles. So they're a building element. Um, they're part of the building itself, but they're also photovoltaic elements incorporated into them. So you get guidance on where to find information right out of the electrical code. And there used to be some requirements where you couldn't put your PV panels directly beneath an emergency escape and rescue opening. So now the code has changed and it says where removal or cutting away of the BIPV system during a firefighting operation has been determined to not expose a firefighter to electrical shock hazards. So again, that would need to come from the manufacturer and they would need to have done some sort of testing or have some sort of method of ensuring that that's the case. All right, here's another one that could be interesting to you. So they've redefined story above grade plane and they've put language in the code that allows a habitable attic to not be considered a story above grade plane. So generally they are. So think of a bonus room up in the trusses so you've got a two-story house, you have a bonus room above. If it's in the trusses, then the question is, is this a three-story single family home or is it a two-story? Now it gets real tricky when you get townhouses similar to the ones here in the picture. Now, if you have bonus rooms up in the trusses of these three-story townhouses, the question becomes, are we adding a four-story and if we do, then we no longer comply with the scoping provisions of the IRC. And now we would be building an R2 or an R3 occupancy out of the IBC. So the code added this exception, a habitable attic shall not be considered a story above grade plane where all of the following are taken into account. First of all, and we're going to jump on the other slide, so there's a list of requirements here. Number one, the area of the habitable attic 
can't be more than one third of the floor area of the story below. Or if you're dealing with a building with fire sprinklers, then that habitable attic is allowed to be up to one half of the floor area of the story below. Now, the other requirements, the occupiable space has to be enclosed by the roof assembly. So bonus type room would comply when you start breaking out of that roof area. Um, it's no longer an enclosed by the roof itself. Next, where the floor of the habitable attic does not extend beyond the exterior walls of the story below. So the habitable attic story cannot cantilever out beyond the exterior wall of the story below. Habitable attic also, if it's located above a third story, so again, we go back to our picture here, we had habitable attic above that third story. Now the code is saying that the entire townhouse unit or the dwelling unit has to be equipped with a fire sprinkler system. So if we go back to this picture, if we wanted a habitable attic above the third story of these townhomes and they were all fire sprinkled, now we could actually have that essentially a fourth story, but per the provisions of the IRC, that bonus room above would not be considered a story above grade, and we could build that under the provisions of the IRC. So that's a pretty, pretty big change and pretty good clarification, which only applies to these sprinkled buildings. Now, the means of egress for a habitable attic still needs to comply with the provisions of section 311. So going back here, looks like the, the gable end of these townhouse units, I don't see any windows, so that would be a problem because you would still need emergency escape and rescue openings from the habitable attic. All right, I think I got another question. The Q&A gave me a, oh, I have to scroll down here, okay. We may have to skip some of these because we've moved on since then. Um, so Alexander is mentioning how in the 2018 IRC and the 2021 for that matter, new townhouse buildings shall have automatic sprinkler systems. And yes, that is the case. However, if you journey from jurisdiction to jurisdiction around the country, a good portion of our jurisdictions have amended that requirement out. So once that requirement's amended out, it really changes kind of the provisions of the code. So the 2021 IRC is basically hedging the bet and saying, well, we know some people will amend this out. So we need to continue to have provisions in the code for a non-sprinkled single family dwelling or townhome just in case that happens. So great comment, Alexander. Another one said, if a landing is provided for a stair, can the second floor exceed 151 inches? And the answer to that is yes. So you could go up 10 feet, for example, have a landing. Then you could go up another 10 feet, have a landing after that, and um, you wouldn't have any problems. So one area where I see that happen frequently is if you have like a an extra deep basement for a sports court or a basketball court, or I've even seen uh, uh, squash and, and racquetball courts in houses. So sometimes they'll do a 20 foot deep basement. So they have a good, you know, arcing three pointers from their basketball court in the basement. And then a single flight of stairs can't get you out of that space because you start exceeding that 151 inches. So in that scenario, they go up halfway, do an intermediate landing, and then have a, an additional slope from there. So great questions, everybody. All right, the code for habitable attics, they removed that section 325.6, and they made a new section. So again, rather than being subsection, now it's its own section 326. So you have to comply with 326.2 and 326.3. You've got minimum dimension requirements. Um, so again, you still have to have a habitable space, which is defined in sections 304 and 305. 
you've got to have your 70 square feet. You've got to have at least seven feet in one direction. And you've got to have at least seven foot headroom. And then there's some exceptions for slope ceilings, et cetera. So Emma McKay asked the question, is this code in action now? And I think that's going to depend on your, your jurisdiction. We do quite a bit of work for different jurisdictions in northern Nevada, as well as cities of Las Vegas. And um, they're generally not using the 2021 code at this moment. But I believe Las Vegas is going to implement it in March of next year. So I, I don't really know the answer to that question. That's going to depend on your local jurisdiction. So hopefully that helps. All right, back to solar related areas and truly non solar in a way. If you're going to have stationary storage battery systems, um, they added that as a new section in the 2018 IRC. And now they renamed it and they moved it. So if you're looking for that information, it's in section 328. So if you're dealing with the Tesla power wall, for example, um, some of those requirements are in there. Okay, we're now going to move on to section chapter four foundations. We're about halfway through the content. And we've got about 45 minutes left of, of talk time. So hopefully I can get through the stuff that matters most. And if not, at least you have the handouts and you can uh, follow up on the last few slides um, some other time. So section 406.2, they just removed some of the options for waterproofing. So we used to be able to use a six mil PVC. That's not allowed. You used to be able to use a six mil polyethylene. And um, those materials just weren't proven to be effective over the long term. So six mil, they were tearing, they were ripping. You can imagine back filling up against a concrete wall. You've got all the form ties and irregularities in the concrete, et cetera. And those materials just weren't cutting it. All right, chapter five, we'll move into floors. So here's an interesting one. The vapor retarder that's required beneath a concrete floor slab has been beefed up a little bit. So it used to be a minimum of a six mil, six mil material. They used to just allow standard polyethylene. Now it needs to be 10 mil and it needs to conform with ASTM E1745 as a class A material. So the rest of the requirements have stayed the same, um, but the thickness of the vapor retarder has increased. Next, we get to footings. So footings shall not be required if you have a freestanding deck consisting of joists that are directly supported on grade for their entire length. So that's kind of interesting. I don't think I've ever run into a deck like that in the real world, but I did find this picture and I guess this is all redwood or cedar or naturally durable material but footings would not be required in the event that you're building a deck of this nature. Number two, the footing shall not be required for a freestanding deck if you meet all of the following criteria. So if you've got your 2021 code, I would circle the word all there um, simply because sometimes we miss that as we're interpreting and implying the code. So one has to be a freestanding deck, and that means that it's not structurally connected to the single family home, townhouse or accessory structure. Has to be structurally independent. The joist bear directly on precast concrete pier blocks at grade without support by beams. The area of the deck can't be more than 200 square feet. And the walking surface cannot be more than 20 inches above grade at any point. And that's gonna be measured extending out an additional 36 inches beyond the edge of the deck itself. There were a lot of changes to the span charts in the code book. So if you're using span charts for sizing decks, for example, there were a lot of changes in there. One example, if you had a 12 foot span, you're going over into table 507.5, um, you're assuming Southern Pine and two two by tens. You used to have a seven foot four limitation and now that's been expanded to nine feet. 
So just want to make you aware that those chart tables have changed a little bit. Um, they've changed some of the rules of thumb that have been used in the past. Um, hopefully your decks aren't built like this one where there's just numerous wood shims everywhere and nothing square or straight. So we'll move on from there. They also added table 507.7, and this is for the, the span between your actual deck joists, depending on the decking material that you're using. So they've expanded this and they've clarified a few things there. Exterior guards. Again, we're talking about decks here and the exterior guards have not necessarily been built in the most logical way in the past. So the code is now coming in and putting more prescriptive language in there. Um, 507.10.1, the guard loads have to be transferred through the deck framing to the deck joists. So your deck, um, your decking itself should not be the only material supporting your guards. 507.10.1.1, uh, if the guards are connected to the interior side of the joist, then they also need to connect to the adjacent joist to prevent rotation. So you think of the, the guards that are running parallel with the joist. If you just nail all your um, vertical guard members to the side of the joist, and then you start putting weight on it from above, it's going to have the desire to just twist. So those would need to be braced together so that you have some resistance there. Three or 507.10.1.2, if they're mounted on top of the decking, then the framing and the blocking is also required to transfer that load to the joists like we talked about. And then lastly, any four by four wood posts that are used cannot be notched at the connections. So it's pretty common to notch the top of your four by four posts and then put your horizontal guard, the top rail of your guard in the recess that you cut out of that post. But obviously as we split those posts, if we have a four by four post and we notch it, um, there's a high probability that at some point that post is just gonna split down the middle and you could have a problem on your hands. Okay, chapter six, wall construction. So some of this stuff, I don't really like some of the prescriptive provisions of the IRC as far as um, span charts and rafter charts and things like that, just because more often than not, me personally, I'm dealing with engineered plans. So some of these changes, I kind of start glossing over. So I apologize. If you use these tables frequently, and these are very important to you, I apologize for not spending more time on them. So in 2018, they expanded table 602.31. So if you see here, the section in green at the bottom, that was added in 2018. Then in 2021, they added fastener options for wall and roof sheathing. And then they also increased the maximum field nailing. So if you've used this table before, you'll see that it's quite a bit larger than it was previously. All right, here's a good one. So section 609.4.1 now requires labeling of garage doors. So if you live in a high wind region or an area where there's flooding, um, the structural integrity of the garage door becomes important. So as you can imagine, if you're an insurance company and you've got a, a big wind event or some flooding and every single property that you insure has the garage door that has been blown in and needs to be replaced, uh, that's a problem. So insurance companies, they hire their different code lobbyists and they get this type of information added to the code. And it's great for the preservation of property, um, but other than that, it's not going to be something that has a huge impact on the construction process itself. So the doors themselves need to be labeled by the door manufacturer. It needs to include the name of the manufacturer, the garage door model or series number, what type of positive and negative pressure the door itself can withstand. And then it needs to have installation instructions and whatever tests that have been taken place. So it's intended to reduce damage from those natural hazards. And this is an example of a, this is probably prior to the 2021 code provisions being finalized, but it tells you who makes the door, 
It doesn't necessarily tell you what make and model of the door it's applied to. It gives you a positive and negative pressure strength, um, but it doesn't give you any drawing reference numbers so that you could verify it's installed properly, et cetera. So kind of interesting. All right, let's talk about wall covering. Well, vapor retarders, as we get into our more efficient buildings and increased um, energy provisions of the energy code, the vapor retarders are becoming more critical. So exception number three was revised. Construction where the accumulation, condensation, or freezing of moisture will not damage materials, then the vapor retarder does not apply. So if I'm building a garage and I go to the Leary company and get a steel building, um, there's no need for a vapor retarder. If there's no conditioning of the building, the building's built out of materials that would not be damaged by condensation, freezing, or moisture. So that's kind of what that exception's intended to be for. Um, they also changed tables. So we added tables one and two. We reorganized three and four. I think I actually got that backwards. Three and four were added and one and two were actually reorganized. So spray foam insulation. So again, we talked about energy codes. And when we get to that section, you'll see the energy requirements have increased substantially. And in order to comply with the new provisions, you're going to see a lot more spray foam insulation having to be used. So this section just clarifies of when the spray foam insulation can qualify as a class one or three vapor retarder. It has to have a max of 1.5 perms, and then it has to have an insulation value, an R value, that complies with tables uh, three and four. or a lot of times we're going to start seeing continuous insulation on the outside face of the building. And if the insulation value of the exterior insulation plus the spray foam insulation in the cavity is equal to or greater to the table, then that would also comply. All right, there was also changes to <clears throat> our fastening table. And if you look on the right hand side, you'll see the airspace columns. And you'll see the airspace, there's a five and five eighths inch airspace, a six and five eighths inch airspace, and a four and five eighths inch airspace. Now that airspace is there because we're going to start seeing a lot more continuous insulation on the exterior face of our sheathing on residential buildings. So be aware of those changes. We'll, we'll get to energy here before too long. So Let's keep moving along as quickly as we can. We talked about the BIPV, building integrated PV panels. So those are covered in section 905.17. Uh, there, there has to be solid decking or closely fitting decking. The slope has to be 212 or greater. You're gonna do underlayment similar to a tile roof. You're still going to need ice and water shield similar to a shingled roof. The materials themselves need to be listed, and you're going to attach them to the structure per the manufacturer's requirements. All right, we're to energy. So this is a big change. There's a lot of changes in here. So we created section 1101.12.5 for additional energy efficiency. So if you've done commercial work, you're probably familiar with using the ComCheck software for a commercial building, you had to pick one of several additions, additional energy efficiency packages. So you could do you know, higher efficiency HVAC, you could do better weather barrier, better ceiling, you could do um, more efficient lighting or lighting controls. So this same concept has now bled over to the IRC world. So if you're using prescriptive energy compliance, then you use one of the additional packages that's listed. If you're using the total BP, then you're going to meet one of the following 2.1 or 2.2. And for buildings complying with N1101.13.3, and you're using the energy rating index, then you've got to be at least 5% better than what the target is in there. So you basically were upping the game on the energy requirements. Not only do you have to comply with the code, 
but then you have to pick kind of a la carte from a selection of different energy efficiency provisions that you're going to incorporate into the single family home uh, to kind of boost the overall energy performance. So rather than mandating that all these different ways of saving energy be applied, all of them combined, you just have to pick one of several. All right, next section, we talk about ceilings without attic spaces. They eliminated the word spaces. The term ceiling was re replaced with interstitial space above a ceiling and below the structural roof deck. So hopefully that's clear. We're talking about the gap between the finished jetboard ceiling inside the house and the underside of the roof deck, and um, not necessarily an attic that you can climb around in. All right, so here's one of the biggest changes as the 2021 code is adopted. If you're in climate zones zero through three, the roof insulation requirement increased from an R38 up to an R49. If you're in climate zones four through eight, it increased from an R49 to an R60. So those are pretty big jumps. Um, where the insulation needed, these are cavity insulation values. And where the insulation that's needed simply won't fit in the cavity, then a minimum of R30 is required. However, you can only use that exception for a portion of your roof area. So you can use it for 500 square feet, or 20% of the ceiling area, whichever is less. So if I have a 1,000 square foot roof, I'm only gonna allow 200 square feet to meet this R30 requirement. Whereas if I have a 10,000 square foot roof, then I'm gonna be limited to the 500 square feet. So if the insulation won't fit in the cavity at that point, then you've gotta either add some insulation above the roof deck, or you need to change the design to allow for a larger cavity. Next change was in the eave baffle. So we've got our cardboard baffles that generally go in the eaves of the roof assembly. And then we blow in the attic with our loose fitting um, cellulose or, or fiberglass insulation. This is clarification that that eave baffle needs to be installed on the outer edge of the exterior wall top plate, where previously they were very frequently being installed on the inside edge. And that was creating a, a gap in the thermal envelope. And heat's generally gonna follow the path of least resistance. So if there's a weak spot in the envelope, although it's a small percentage of the overall envelope area, a big majority of the heat loss is going to occur at that location. Next change that may be tricky for you is attic access patches. So access hatches and doors from conditioned to unconditioned spaces, such as attics and crawl spaces, they have to be insulated to the same level that's required for the wall or the ceiling R value. So if I have an attic hatch in a climate zone five, for example, and the attic has to have an R60 insulation, now my attic hatch itself needs to have an R60 insulation value. Looks like we got a question from John. Does the R60 requirement apply to Northern Nevada? So I believe so, it just depends on your climate zone of your individual jurisdiction. Um, we do some work in Reno and Elko and Douglas County, and um, you're just gonna have to look at that map. So I'm not perfectly familiar with exactly where those climate zones are drawn. Um, but they definitely apply to the to the Salt Lake area where I am. We've got climate zone five and six in northern Utah, so I would assume you're going to have similar climate zones there. All right, so you've got to insulate your hatch to the same level as your roof. Now, if you get to R60, you may be familiar that you generally, with an attic access hatch, in the past, you just kind of throw an a loose fill um, fiberglass bat up above your attic hatch. Well, they don't make an R60 insulated bat. So most likely what you're gonna see and what 
builders are going to have to do is they're going to have to glue multiple layers of an uh, insulating foam to the upper side of their attic access hatch in order to achieve those values. But when you think about it, again, if you blow R60 into your whole attic and then you've got a half inch sheet of drywall that's your only um, your only barrier to the attic, a lot of your heat's just gonna pass through that R60 or through that sheetrock and you're gonna lose most of it up through the attic anyway. So it's a good change. It's kind of always been in the code, but now it's spelled out crystal clear. There are some exceptions. If you're using a door to provide attic access, so say I have a bonus room and in the back wall of the bonus room, there's a door and that gets me into the attic. Then that door would just need to comply with the U factor values for a door. And then if you have a horizontal pull down stair, um, that's always been a challenge as well. So if you have a pull down stair, the question is, well, do I put in fiberglass bat on top of it? And then every time I pull down the stair, the bat flies down at me. So the requirement here is you have to, if you're in climate zone zero through four, you don't have to do anything. If you're in zones five through eight, then you have to comply with these four requirements. So the average U factor of the hatch has to be at least equal to R10 or greater. So you could buy an insulated pull down access ladder. And if it had a U value of 0 0.1 or an R value of 10, then you're gonna comply. If not less than 75% of the panel has a value of R13 or greater, then that would comply. If the net area of the framed opening is less than or equal to 13.5 square feet. And if the perimeter of the hatch is weather stripped, then the reduction shall not apply to the total UA alternative. So again, you have to meet all of the following and you basically need to plan ahead because a lot of these pull down access ladders have no insulation and there's really no way to insulate them, and they're just problematic in general. So Emma McKay says that parts of northern Nevada are zone seven. So in that scenario, you would be at that R60 requirement. All right, next thing, section 1102.4 tells us that our buildings need to be tested for air leakage. The maximum leakage is five air changes per hour, and that's going to depend on climate zone as well. So zone zero, one, and three, five air changes per hour. Um, that should say zero, one, and two. Zones three through eight is three air changes per hour. Testing needs to be performed at any time after all the penetrations into the thermal envelope have been sealed. Now that's penetrations from either side, from the exterior as well as penetrations from the interior. So our most common penetrations on the interior are our electrical boxes and our light switch boxes. So we'll get into that here in a minute. So basically what this 2021 code is saying is that we have to blow our door test all of our residential buildings. Now the exception there is in a private attached and detached heated garages they can be assumed accepts, acceptable if they've been field verified and if they're isolated from other conditioned spaces. So previously we had a couple different routes. You could do a air test, lower door test, or you could meet this long provision of prescriptive requirements for sealing openings, et cetera. Now you have to air test for the prescriptive requirements of the 2021 IRC. All right, so electrical and our communication boxes need to be air sealed. So the box itself has to be sealed, tested, and marked for compliance. So that's going to be from the manufacturer. Then they need to be tested per NEMA OS4. Um, they need to have an air leakage of 2.0 cubic feet per minute or less. And then they need to have that marking on the box itself of NEMA OS4 or just OS4. So that's quite a change. So as you look at that, it's going to be a package deal between the, the box and the faceplate. They're going to be gasketed or have some other method of sealing. 
And that's going to reduce that air leakage that we've always had through our electrical boxes themselves. So here's a picture from my house when my, my kid, the light switch wasn't working in my kid's room. And I found out the breaker was tripped and he had thrown a necklace over the nightlight. It went down to the prongs that were plugged in that outlet there, arced across and uh, welded the chain to the outlet itself. So anyway, these boxes are a big source of air leakage and the code's addressing how they're going to be addressed there. Okay, next in the 2018 code, the code said that 90% of all of your permanently installed light fixtures had to be high efficacy. Before that, it was 75%. So 2015, we were at 75, 2018, 90. Now we're in the 2021 code and 100% of all permanently installed lighting. So the only place you should see an incandescent bulb would be in a lamp that is a portable non-permanent light fixture. All our other fixtures will be high efficacy, which is generally going to be LED. All right, if we're using the energy rating index, the values, they're kind of dialing it back. So in 2015, we had the values in blue. 2018, they kicked them all up about 10% to the values in black. And then they decided that they had pushed the envelope a little bit too far. So we've revised them back to the same values we originally had in 2015. All right, we're going on to mechanical. We might just make it. We've got 15 minutes. So the one change in the mechanical code is the energy codes are pushing a lot for the um, whole house ventilation. So an incentive to have a balanced ventilation system is that that will now allow for a 30% reduction to the mechanical ventilation airflow rates. So if we have a balanced system, which is defined as the supply airflow and the total exhaust airflow are within 10% of each other, then we can reduce our mechanical ventilation airflow rate by 30%. So with these types of systems, we're going to have more airflow. We're not going to rely on these big systems that can, you know, pull air into the building through infiltration and things like that. And we're going to be able to reduce the, the airflow itself. So kind of an interesting change. Let's move on to plumbing changes. So the one main change in the 2021 code is our hot water pipe lengths or within the house are limited to 100 feet. So that includes water heaters and recircul recirculating system piping. So if we're gonna pump hot water from a water heater to the far reaches of a very large house, we're limited to 100 feet. If we can't reach that in 100 feet, then we're gonna have to provide a, a, a separate appliance within that 100 feet. All right, now we move on to electrical. A few changes to electrical. We had an emergency service disconnect is now required in a readily accessible outdoor location. So if you remember previously, you could have your meter on your house and you could have the, you could have your meter on your house and then you could have your disconnect inside the house at your sub panel. And the code has changed to where you have to have a disconnect on the outside of the house somewhere. If more than one is provided, they need to be grouped in the same location. Each disconnect is required to have the following text on the disconnect itself. So that's just labeling that's going to be required. And what else is on here? You have to identify that it's not service equipment if it's simply a disconnect. Now, the next thing that changed is surge protection is required. So all services are required to be provided with a surge protective device. So this is a very far sweeping requirement to have these disconnects on the outside. So fire department, whoever else can turn off the power and to provide surge protection all the time 
in all single family dwellings. Alexander's got another question here. He says three story, 10 buildings, 44 dwelling units, no elevators, rental use. Chapter IBC does not, chapter 11 of IBC does not apply. Yep. So that's kind of a hole in things where we've got these, a lot of builders are building entire subdivisions and not selling a single home in the subdivision. And they simply rent all, all the units out, just like an apartment complex, but they're all IRC buildings. So in Alexander's example, you really could have as many townhomes or townhouses and townhouse units. Um, they could all be rentals and there's no provisions of the IBC or provisions of the accessibility standards that would apply as far as construction goes. Now, when you get into the Americans with Disabilities Act, which we don't enforce as code officials, although we enforce the A117 standards, um, the owner of that type of a facility could still be subject to the requirements of those laws, but they wouldn't be provisions that we have control over as building inspectors or building departments. So great comment. Okay. Next thing that changed is GFCI protection is now required for all 125 volt through 250 volt receptacles. So previously, all your 110 outlets that were in, you know, wet locations, outdoors, um, unfinished basements, things like that, they needed to be GFCI protected, but your 220 outlets did not. So this has changed. So now if it's a 240 outlet for your dryer and it's six feet from a sink, now that outlet needs to have GFCI protection. It's generally going to be on the breaker. I haven't seen a 220 GFCI receptacle yet, but the code requires that. And the only way to do it would be through the breaker itself. So that's quite a change as well. Next change code used to require GFCI protection for all unfinished basement receptacles. The code has now changed to require GFCI protection in all basement areas. So if the receptacle is in a basement, it needs to have GFCI protection. So that is quite a change that I'm sure is surprising to you. Brian Grill asked a question. You said that the disconnect has to be readily accessible. Does that mean it has to be separate from the exterior service entrance or did you mean accessible? Right, let's see here. I might have read, said one thing and meant another thing. So it says readily accessible and that means without the use of tools or removal, removing of permanent construction. So it needs to be readily accessible, meaning that you can just uh, reach out and flip the switch or open a panel. It can't be in a locked enclosure. All right, next Roger asks, does this also apply to electrical car outlets? Yes. So if it's a 220 volt receptacle and it's located in a location such as an, a garage, then it needs to be GFCI protected. Again, all of our basement 110 receptacles and 220 receptacles are going to have to be GFCI protected. And now we're gonna move on to reference standards and we've got six minutes left. So I'm pretty impressed that we've made it through all of this. Um, last time I taught this, it was a full day class and I had to pare this down and determining how many slides to include was kind of a challenge. So. Appreciate the questions. Hopefully I've been able to answer most of your questions. All right, so here's the changes when you get into appendices and reference standards. 2015 IRC had appendix A through U. And if you remember, none of these appendices um, are applicable unless your jurisdiction has specifically adopted them. Now what you can do, even if your jurisdiction has not adopted them, is you can take a look and you can see if information from these help you to apply the code in a more reasonable and more logical manner. So these appendices are very useful, even if you haven't necessarily adopted them. 
2018 IRC had appendix A through T. And then we get into the 2021 IRC, and now we've got to go to the double, light, double letter standard because we're going to exceed A through Z. So we've got AA through AW. So we've got quite a few appendices now. And then they also added resource A. So resource A is all of your accessibility provisions um, so that you've got them handy when you might not necessarily have the full A117 available to you. So hold on one second here. So resource A, oh wait, resource A, I'm, I'm mistaken here. I'm going to fall on my face in the last five minutes here, so I apologize. Resource A is very interesting. It's a standard that's come up, which is our recommended practices for remote virtual inspection, so RVI. So this is ICC's acknowledgement that as we move into the future, it probably applies to a lot of these Nevada jurisdictions that may be kind of spread out from one another or have very large boundaries. Some sort of remote virtual inspection is probably going to be a part of our future. And this is kind of ICC's first attempt at giving you some direction on how that might work. Someone wanted me to show the two previous slides. I don't know which two those were. So I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, Roger asked when these 2021 codes come into effect, and I'm not sure, depending on your jurisdiction, um, it may vary. I believe uh, City of Las Vegas was going to adopt um, in March of next year. So that's the last I know. So resource A gives you some of our virtual inspection provisions that may be helpful to you. And then next, we have um, Appendix F was added in the 2018. It gives you 11 criteria for radon gas systems. So it's not required to provide one yet, but when they are provided, there are provisions on how to properly install them. Then here's our resource A. We just talked about that, recommended practices for remote virtual, virtual inspections and it gives you some information that may be helpful to your local jurisdiction. So here's probably your best slide here. If you were sent by your company or your firm to this presentation and you're required to summarize everything I talked about in the last two hours, you can just use this as your cheat sheet and you can find the key items in here that we talked about and you can report those back to your boss and you can look like you were paying very good attention to everything that I said here. So appreciate everybody's time. It's been a, a great summary and a great review for myself as well. We look forward to applying these 2021 codes and feel free to reach out. I'm sure that Stacy can get you my contact information and I'm happy to take phone calls and emails whenever questions come up and that's that's what I do all day long. So appreciate everyone's time. Thanks, George. Um, some people have been asking in the chat if they're going to get these handouts. Yes, um, I'll be sending an email at the end of the day and it will have a link um, where you can download the handouts from this session and all the other sessions as well. All right. Thanks so much. And I guess um, enjoy your weekend, everybody. You've answered all the questions. So that was a lot of information. Thanks, George. Um, okay. okay, everyone, we have um, about 15 minutes before we go back into the general session. You uh, getting back into the general session is going to be easier than when you came here. All you need to do is go to the link, um, the Zoom link that you received that you used to get into the main session this morning. So um, just go back there and we'll see everyone at 3.30. I'll hang out here to, if anyone has any problems. Um, I can try to help you get back to that main session. So we'll see you at 3.30.
Hey, I still see about 80 people logged in. If any of you are having trouble getting back to the main session, can you let us know in the chat, please? I'm going to head over to the main session. If anyone has trouble, just drop it in the chat and someone in the tech department can help you. <laughs> 